Just desserts is a correctional philosophy where criminal justice officials do not take an individual's circumstances into account when deciding whether or not to give an individual a punishment and if so how much punishment to give that person. Scholars who advocate for a just desserts correctional philosophy tend to only look at the action and they seldom if ever consider the circumstances which may have led an individual to commit a criminal act. Just desserts is a non-utilitarian theory of corrections. The only focus is on balancing the scales of justice. Offenders are punished for the mere sake of punishment. They have harmed, so in turn, they should suffer harm. This will, in turn, achieve balance. Opponents of just desserts correctional philosophies argue that there are problems with this perspective. One of the major problems is that we often want our correctional system to do more than merely impose just desserts. Given the fact that the United States spends over $70 billion a year incarcerating its citizens, we would hope that this money is invested in a manner that re will reduce crime and make society safer. But according to Francis Colin and Cheryl Johnson, advocates who favor retribution and just desserts philosophies are primarily concerned with punishing criminals for what they have done. They are not concerned with general deterrence or rehabilitation. It is the punishment and the punishment alone that matters the most. Many scholars tend to use the phrases retribution and just desserts interchangeably. And while there are certainly a number of similarities between these two concepts, there is at least one important distinction. Social conservatives generally believe in retribution and they contend that retribution demands the imposition of punishment on offenders. Liberals, on the other hand, favor just desserts. They seek to limit the imposition of punishment on offenders. In practical terms, those favoring retribution want to get tough, whereas those favoring just desserts want to get lenient. Both positions want the punishment to fit the crime, though. So, for example, if an offender commits a crime, both a just desserts and a retribution theorist would argue that there should be an exact and a precise punishment regardless of the reasons that the individual may have committed the crime to begin with. The advocate of retribution would argue that a fixed punishment will make sure that this offender has been adequately punished. An advocate of just desserts will also want a fixed exact punishment but it will be for different reasons. The just desert scholar will want a criminal to have a precise, precisely prescribed penalty to ensure that he or she will be treated the same as everyone else who commits the same offense. The only concern of both retribution and just desserts is that the punishment fit the crime and that everyone who commits the same crime is given exactly the same offense. Advocates of retribution and just desserts despise discretion. Opinion polls show that the public values retribution and just deserts correctional philosophies. Nevertheless, there are some problems with both of these correctional philosophies according to Francis Colin and Cheryl Johnson. First, we have an enormous prison problem in the United States. As you may recall from a previous lecture in the U.S. on any given day, more than 2.4 million people find themselves incarcerated in correctional facilities. If retribution and just deserts correctional philosophies do not provide criminal justice officials with the discretion to divert offenders from prison, then America's current incarceration binge will only continue. A second problem with retribution and just desserts correctional philosophies is that human behavior, including criminal activity, is often determined by individual traits and social experiences. For example, if an individual perceives that he or she needs to steal for self-preservation and survival, this is a mitigating circumstance that retribution and just desserts advocates will tend to ignore. Research shows us that societal forces such as poverty and a lack of educational opportunities and a lack of social welfare programs may push some individuals into crime. If this is the case, 
shouldn't criminal justice officials do something to change these circumstances? And is there a way that the individual who breaks the law could themselves be changed or rehabilitated once they enter the criminal justice system? Advocates of retribution are comfortable with allowing unreformed offenders, once they have been punished, to be released from criminal justice supervision and to return back to society. Does this seem problematic to you? You might ask yourself how theories of just desserts and retribution became popular. Both of these correctional philosophies emerged in the wake of the 1971 Stanford Prison Experiment. In this famous experiment, Professor Philip Zimbardo constructed a mock prison in the basement of Stanford University. He assigned students to be either guards or inmates and he illustrated that prisons did not seem to offer inmates with any meaningful opportunities to redeem themselves. In this experiment, psychologically healthy college students started to act their roles as guards or prisoners. It was not long before the student turned guards began to act in a sadistic and brutal manner toward the student turned inmates. To many scholars, this study indicated that correctional facilities were incapable of reforming offenders. And of course, as you may recall from a previous lecture in 1974, Robert Martinson published a famous essay which argued that nothing works in correctional treatment. Both of the above studies, as well as the political climate of the mid-1970s, made scholars and policymakers begin to look for other correctional philosophies such as just desserts and retribution. Let's now take a look at deterrence theory, which is a correctional philosophy that is based upon the notion that people consciously try to avoid pain and seek pleasure. Deterrence theory posits that crime rates will be lowest in places where offending evokes the most pain or costs, and highest in those places where offending evokes the most pleasure or benefits. Advocates of deterrence theory argue that to reduce crime, the correctional system should be organized to maximize the pain of crime and to minimize its benefits. While intuitively this seems to make sense, it is important to point out that not everyone experiences the threat of a correctional punishment the same way. For example, some people are impulsive, short-sighted, inebriated, and under the sway of peer influence. Therefore, they might not be able to consciously weigh the potential consequences with the perceived benefits of committing a certain criminal act. Deterrence theory is associated with a view of offenders that can be traced back to the Enlightenment era in the 19th, excuse me, in the 1700s and with Cesar Beccaria, who is the major theorist who is associated with the classical school of criminology. Cesar Beccaria argued that a punishment will be most likely to deter crime if it, is, if it is certain, swift, and sufficiently severe, though not overly severe. Of all these, the certainty of punishment is probably the most important. Current research studies indicate that people do not become concerned or as concerned about the severity of punishment if they do not believe they will ever get caught to begin with. When thinking about deterrence theory, one should also know the difference between general deterrence and specific deterrence. General deterrence posits that society punishes an offender so that other people will not go into crime. In other words, the criminal is made to be an example that will deter others from engaging in certain acts. The reasoning behind general deterrence is that by punishing a limited number of offenders, we may persuade a whole bunch of other potential criminals not to break the law. There is also specific deterrence, which posits that if society punishes an individual offender, then this will decrease the likelihood that he or she will not recidivate. However, this is not always the case. For example, specific deterrence would have us believe that offenders who are sentenced to prison would be less likely to recidivate than offenders put on probation. However, the criminological research does not support this finding. In fact, some research has suggested exactly the opposite. The reason for this is that in some instances there may be a brutalization effect where increased punishments are associated with increased crime. 
For example, let us suppose that a repeat drug offender is sent to prison rather than given probation. It is possible that this individual's exposure to prison life may be so nasty and punitive that once he is released, he actually emerges as a much more hard criminal than he ever was to begin with. Also, if an individual is sent to prison for long periods of time, he may be cut off from family and friends. If an offender loses the support of loved ones, this may make his transition from prison to the outside world much more complicated and challenging, to say the least. Needless to say, criminologists have been researching deterrence for several years. While there are mixed findings, Francis Cullen and Cheryl Johnson argue that the influence of deterrence on criminal behavior diminishes as the quality of the research study increases. In other words, the better the research design, the weaker the relationship that exists between perceived deterrence and crime. Also, when studies control for other predictors of crime, such as peer influence, antisocial attitudes, and relationships with parents, among other variables, then the strength of the relationship of, the, of deterrence variables to crime decreases. Multivariate studies, ones that examine how deterrence variables stack up against other predictors from other theories, suggest that the effects of certainty of punishment are weak and the effects of severity of punishment are weak to non-existent. As you are reading through the material for this session, be sure to examine the program known as Hawaii's Opportunity Probation with Enforcement. Here, a judge in Hawaii conducted his own experiment where he assigned misbehaving probationers to immediate, on-the-spot detention followed by a hearing. A rigorous, randomized experimental evaluation discovered that compared to those on regular probation, the HOPE probationers failed fewer drug tests, they missed fewer appointments, and they committed fewer new crimes. As you reflect upon this study, ask yourself whether or not you agree with the HOPE program. Should comparable types of experiments be conducted? And are there any potential human subjects issues associated with conducting these types of experiments? Also, what does the HOPE program tell us about deterrence theory? And finally, as you conclude all of the reading for this session, take a moment to think about retribution and just desserts correctional philosophies. How do these perspectives compare to the philosophy of deterrence? And of all the correctional philosophies we have discussed so far, which do you believe has the most merit and why?